I'm going to talk about two problems that have concerned me for many years. And I'm going to try to give a possible solution to both. One of the problems is why is mathematics still going on? Why isn't it dead? Why isn't it over? Why is it not only not dead, but why is it that we are now living in the greatest age of math ever? And why if we came back a thousand years from now, it would still be the greatest age of math ever? And the second thing is why is it for those of us who do math, when you discover new mathematics, it's not just cute or amusing, but you feel a deep and profound sense of surprise. You actually feel like you're experiencing the sublime. And what I'm going to do is try to say that I think the, what links those two questions is that there are certain fundamental questions that everyone has to answer. And that the answers to those questions are not independent of each other. That they depend upon each other. There's relations among the answers. And once you have relations among the answers, you ask questions about those relations, and you have relations among those answers. And you have relations upon relations upon relations, and the next thing you know, you have breathtaking structure. For me, actually, descriptions of the universe. So the first thing is, what about this math still going on? Um, people do ask me about that. They say, what, what, you know, you do research? What does that mean? You know, discover a new number? Um, <laughs> I'm guessing actually a lot of people here think, what is it, just working the really hard problems in calculus books maybe? You know, sort of like I think an English professor just really write book reports. You know, I know it's not that, but something. Um, and that's not the case. It's going on all the time. Now everyone here, and I expect almost everyone, believes math is important. Rarely do I come across someone says, you know what, we're wasting our time in elementary schools. Stop that multiplication table stuff. No one thinks that. What they don't know is that it's still going on. The problem with explaining how it's going on is that it becomes very technical very fast. And so I could try to talk about what current research is in broad generalities in an almost patronizing and I'll guarantee you condescending fashion, <laughs> or I could just state that it's happening. Like for example, one of the great events in math was about 10 years ago. Perlman proved the Poincaré conjecture. I'm sure you all remember it. <laughs> he, of course, to explain it, you have to explain about three manifolds, but let's not get into there. And of course, he used the Ricci flow, which of course the Ricci flow is the heat equation applied to the scalar curve. Scalar curvature course is, well, you take the Riemann curvature tensor, then you take the trace of the trace of the curve, and you go, it becomes technical fast. <laughs> Even my own research, which pales in comparison to someone like Perlman, you know, I've been really concerned about cube roots, cube root of 2, cube root of 5, the structure of those things. And so of course, what you study is, you start with a number 1, you start with alpha, your cube root, you look at alpha squared, 1, alpha, alpha squared, you of course look at a 3 by 3 matrix, then you look at, well, the 3 by 3 matrix is full of integer entries, maybe rational entries, and you look at the eigenvectors and eigenvalues, but again, it becomes technical fast. Even though all the words I use aren't all that hard mathematically. So if nothing else you take away from tonight, know that math is still going on. And the greats, what they do overwhelmingly is there be one area of math here, one area of math here, both decent, interesting areas, and they discover profound interconnections. And it's just breathtaking. For example, one of the highest awards in mathematics is the Fields Medal. Sort of frequently called the Nobel Prize for math, but it's not really, but you have to get it before you're age 40. So I'm not that bitter. Um, one of the greatest living mathematicians is Terry Tao. He's phenomenal. He is changing the way we think about mathematics. He is in his early 30s. Uh, in 2006, he won a Fields Medal, well deserved. In fact, six months before he won it, before we knew he was going to win it, we had an entire day here during winter study studying his work because we were so impressed by it. Um, in the announcement of his award, Charles Pfefferman at Princeton, who's also one of the greats, who's a little older than me, wrote about Terry Tao. Mathematics at the highest level has several flavors. On seeing it, one might say, what amazing technical power. It's hard. What grand synthesis. How could anyone not have seen this before? 
Where on earth did this come from? The work of Terence Tao encompasses all of the above. Notice what it said, technical power. That's why it's hard to explain it to people. What a grand synthesis, pulling things together. How could anyone not have seen this before? I mean, once you see it, you go, that's so beautiful and obvious. Where on earth did this come from? Profound sense of surprise. Now, that profound sense of surprise comes up all the time. It's kind of like the light bulb moment. You know, you're coming and looking at something, it's like, oh, oh, I get it. Oh, that's right. But it's kind of like the light bulb moment hooked up to, you know, the lights on Times Square. It's just, whoa! This is amazing. Um, why do we have that sense of surprise? Why is it when you discover great mathematics, it feels both right and pleasing, deeply pleasing? Here's why. I think there are some basic questions. And I think to answer those questions, there are relations to the answers. I'm going to list a candidate of those five questions. This, by the way, if I was feeling nervous, I would say, hey, just we're playing with these ideas. If I am feeling emboldened, which I'm not right now, I would say, this is going to be a new way of setting up the foundations of mathematics. That's if I was going to grab the bull by the horns. Here are five questions that I think are basic. First, how many are there? Second, how big is it? Third, how fast is it changing? Fourth, where is it? And fifth, what does it look like? Those are basic questions to understand anything. How many are there? How big is it? How fast is it changing? Where is it? And what's it look like? You can rave, weave stories about how mouth developed. Some lonely goat herd with goats going, how many goats I got? You know, how much is there? How much land in the Nile with the flooding? Who knows how math developed? But you can imagine the stories. I'm going to give you an example of a relation between answers to those questions. A relation between a question of how much is there with a how fast is it changing? a profound relation between those answers. I'm going to be talking about the fundamental theorem of calculus. That is a theorem that you cannot overestimate its importance in human history. To a large extent, it gave birth to the modern world. It answers a how much is there question and how fast is it changing. Actually, more accurately, it takes a how much is there question and a how fast is it changing question and show that they're opposite sides of the same coin. So let me explain it. A how fast is it changing question. The tool to study how fast is it changing, one of the tools, is a technical thing called the derivative. Many of you have taken calculus. The derivative tells you how fast is something changing now. If this was not Western Massachusetts, but Amarillo, Texas, where I grew up, in a slightly larger room than this, there would probably now suddenly come from the attic a bat. That happened a lot. A bat would be flying around. The derivative would tell you how fast is the bat changing there, or there, or there. It's a tool that tells you how fast something changes. How much is there? How much is there is a separate question that would involve something called the integral. The integral tells you is how much is there, how much area, how much volume, how much junk is there. Now I'm going to show you the connection. Let's start with this being the bottom. And let's have some sort of curve going boom. If this was made out of wood, there'd be a chunk of wood there. You could carpet it. It would be a certain area. The calculation of that area woo, is called the integral. Big, funny looking S thing. There's all technical ways of how you figure out how much area there is. Paint, it's how much paint there. 
I'm claiming that this area thing, boom, big piece of wood, that right there, somehow it's linked to a how fast is it changing. Well, what's changing? Here's what's changing. If I have my little function, I move this way, I have a little area, I move a little bit, I get a slightly different area. I go this way, a little less area, a little more area, a little area, a little area. The derivative is how fast is that area changing right there? And here's the answer. It's the height right here. That length right there is how fast the thing is changing. So the derivative of how fast this is changing is linked to how high the stupid curve is. That's amazing. <laughs> and it means every time you have a how fast is it changing question, you look for how big is their question that's going to be linked to it. Every time you see a how big is their question, you look for a how fast is it changing question. Now, the fundamental theorem of calculus was done late 1600s, Leibniz, Newton, independently. By the 1800s, people were getting kind of excited about electricity, electricity and magnetism. First, they just seemed like kind of curiosities. No one had images of this, you know, our world is full of electrical currents. But in studying this electricity and magnetism, they had magnetic fields, you know, kind of like when you have the little next to your fridge, the magnet, just woo, fields filling up, electric fields, ah, shocks. All of those is they started trying to see how much things flowed through things. And that was causing how fast is it changing was linked to how much is there. And they developed what's called in multivariable calculus things like Green's theorem, the divergence theorem, uh, Stokes' theorem, leading to the 20th century to a profound interconnection with this one beautiful theorem, now called Stokes' theorem, that's linked to electricity magnetism, it's called differential forms, linked to all kinds of things. And it's all coming from trying to answer a how fast is there a question with a how much is there. Now I'm claiming that that's what gives structure to mathematics. Is that to answer those five questions, that there's relations among the answers. But what's about the sense of surprise? It seems the case that the relations among the answers are surprising. You would not predict this. I would not have predicted a how fast is there question being at all linked to how much is there. But they're linked in a very technical sense. And there is that sense of surprise. So here's something. If you feel a sense of surprise mathematically, that's a way you can actually do research. If you see us have a sense of surprise, you go, something's going on. You try to identify the underlying questions that support that sense of surprise, then you look for it in applications that seem are in different contexts. Of course, you could be wrong. So these would probably be called fallible flags. That's a term that Brianna Malavich in the philosophy department here came, told me when I was talking to her about these ideas a few years ago. And I said, your sense of surprise should be a flag that something might be going on. There's new research. But of course, you could be wrong. And she said, we'll call it a fallible flag. And those really do happen, that you can have an idea, and frequently it's wrong. Um, I guess the best example, there was a well-known statistician who I will not mention his name. It was not Dick DeVoe. Um, who in the 80s was noticing that in the math world, there was a revolution going on in three-manifold theory and a revolution in three-folds. He heard the word three, assumed it was the same revolution. And he was surprised about this because one area was topologists, the other was algebraic geometers. And when he told me this, I kind of looked at him and went, they have nothing to do with each other. The three is by chance. You know, the three manifolds was three-dimensional objects. The three-folds were complex three, and that's really six-dimensional. There was no, except for the word three, he had a fallible flag. So here is my bold proposal. There's a number of ways of setting, there's two basic ways of setting up the foundations of mathematics, of making it on a logical, rigorous basis. One is using set theory, and the other is category theory. Set theory is probably the best known. Started about 100, a little over 100 years ago. It was taught to people my age starting, I believe, in third grade. It's for people my age, that's what the new math was, set theory. Category theory was started in the mid 20th century, and it's a very 20th century phenomenon. 
I propose a possible new foundation. That's in terms of find a fundamental list of questions. I don't know exactly how to make that axiomatic. But get rid of the old axiomatic methods of mathematics. Well, don't get rid of it. It's beautiful. But make the foundations basic questions. Try to find and identify the relations of those questions. I would even be so bold is that that's how you can do almost all academic exercise and make it more mathy, which is a good thing. <laughs> In any given discipline, ask, what is a revolution? You could ask that question. What does it mean to be great? I try to identify not just the good questions, but the fundamental questions. That will lead to something hopefully very beautiful. So in closing, I would say the following, just to make sure I remembered what I said. There are surprises in mathematics. These surprises stem from relations among the answers to basic questions. This means there are basic questions. Answers to these questions are not independent of each other. This creates questions about the relations of the answers. There are now relations of relations, etc. This provides a new method for structuring mathematics. Identify basic questions from relations of the answer, rebuild the foundations of mathematics. This also provides a method for discovering new mathematics. Find the surprises. Find the fallible flags. Identifying underlying relations causing these senses of surprise. Find relations among similar problems in different contexts. Then you're starting to really take seriously that mathematics might be the structure of the universe, which I secretly believe, even though I don't know what those words mean. Thank you very much. <laughs>